with cooking tips, information and 100 recipes to stake your life on. Right, now it's all about stress-free cooking. Cooking dishes in advance is a brilliant way of taking the stress out of cooking at home. And many dishes just get better and better with time. First up, my amazing sticky pork ribs. One of the secrets to great cooking is patience. Leaving dishes to marinate for one or two days helps to develop the flavour in your food and the end result is so much more delicious. It's a method I use in the restaurants all the time. First off, get your roasting tray. Put the tray on the gas. Pork ribs, 60% meat and 35, 40% fat. Give them a really good season. Salt and pepper. The nice thing about this cut, they stay incredibly moist when they're on the bone. And the longer you cook them, the more delicious they become. Just push all that seasoning in to the pork. Olive oil in. Make sure that tray's nice and hot. And I really want that nice sort of caramelization taking place on the pork. And that's the nice thing about starting it on top of the stove. Use your roasting tray, get them colored, and then in the oven. Putting the ribs straight in the oven, you don't get the color. It looks sort of boiled as opposed to a nice caramelized rib. Ginger. You can't beat fresh ginger with sticky pork ribs. Place it down nice and firmly and slice. The thinner you slice the ginger, the more fragrant the ribs. Garlic. And it's really important, before you add anything to those ribs, make sure you've got the colour in the ribs first. Don't rush it. Turn them over. That's what I want. That nice. Crispy colour. As they sort of braise in the oven, all that colour just turns into the most amazing flavour. Braising is just a chef term for cooking something slowly in liquid. Right, ginger and garlic in. Spread it around on all those ribs to sort of roast the ginger and the garlic. Chili flakes. Chili flakes in. Next, Szechuan pepper. Citrusy, vibrant peppercorns. Incredible. In. Next, star anise. That gives it a really nice sort of aniseed flavour, almost like you're roasting the ribs in fennel. In. Now we've got the heat, got the spice. I want to sweeten things up a little bit. Some fresh honey. Honey glazes the pork beautifully, counteracts against all that spice in there. But look what's happening. The colour on the ribs is extraordinary. It's like a really nice chilli, sweet caramel. Now, soy sauce. Brings that little bit of sort of saltiness to it. Really generous with the soy sauce. Japanese vinegar. Two tablespoons of vinegar in. Rice wine. It gives it that nice sort of um, tartness to the ribs. If you can't find rice wine, a dry sherry is a great substitute. 300 ml. That takes out the heat of that Szechuan pepper, those dry chili flakes. Make sure they're all laid down. Like a nice, tight box of matches. Bring that up to the boil. Cooking is all about learning to develop your own likes and dislikes. So always keep tasting to make sure you're happy with a combination of flavours. Mm. It's lacking a little touch of vinegar. I want that sharpness. Now think what's going on. The tartness, the heat, the caramel, the colour on the ribs is amazing. I want a bit of a sort of oniony flavour. We'll put some spring onions in. Whilst these ribs are in the oven, the spring onions will sort of puree but give a sharpness to the final taste of that pork. In with my spring onions. In with my stock, 400 ml of stock. This is just a simple chicken stock. The stock just sits underneath the ribs. It absorbs into the rib, and the top of the rib glazes underneath the rib. That gets crispy and rich, and that's what makes the ribs nice and moist. Really important. Into the oven. Mm. Cook at 180 for 30 minutes. Then turn the ribs over and cook for a further 30 minutes. Now. Wow. They smell incredible. Each side has got that really nice, crispy, roasted edge. It becomes sticky and chewy and sweet, sour. The fat's disappeared and the pork just melts in your mouth. I want to take them to the next level. Gas back on. Now, shake the tray. And this is the sort of the way that we finish them in the restaurant. And for every minute 
They glaze in that tray. They just get to taste better and better. Now look at them. I'm so happy with those. Ribs done. Absolutely delicious now. But if you want, you can put them in the fridge and the flavour will keep developing. Then just reheat them when you want to serve. So, each rib has a nice slice of ginger on there. Wow, look at that. Delicious sticky ribs with an amazing marinade. To make my food the tastiest it can be, I always start with the best ingredients I can find. And the secret to getting the best is simple. Knowledge is crucial. The more you know about where your ingredients come from and how they're produced, the better. So, ask lots of questions and learn. When it comes to buying pork, you can't do any better than ask a butcher. And award-winning master butcher Danny Lidgate knows everything about the pig from trotter to tail. This family have been in the meat business for 150 years, so this man really is on the money. In comparison with other meats, pork's really good value. You get some really good cuts at really reasonable prices, and you can use everything from the tip of the trotter down to the cheek. We can see here we've got the leg. The leg is about this region, really lean, really good for things like gammons and hams. Coming down from the leg, we've got the loin, and that's where the pork chops come from. If you take the bones out, you can bone and roll it, and you end up with a really nice, easy-to-cook cylinder of meat, really easy to carve, carve like a loaf of bread. Coming away from the loin, we've got the belly, and you can see where the belly is made up of fatty parts and meaty parts. Don't be scared of the amount of fat that's on it. You need that fat to give, give the flavours coming through. Also, make sure you can possibly buy it with the skin on. The skin will crispen up nice and give you good crackling. Also, add flavour into the fat. Lower down from the bellies, we've got the shoulders. Really, the shoulders are a great meat. They're slightly fattier than the rest of the animal. You can see with this pork shoulder the amount of marbling you get in the muscles, the interior marbling. Make sure you look for the marbling. It's essential for the flavour and it's going to make a really good eating experience. With a pig, there really is nothing to waste. The trotters even are really good flavour because of their gelatinous qualities and the meat can be really, really flavoursome. Also, there's pig's cheeks, which Obviously require a little bit more cooking because of the use they get, but the flavours you're going to get are going to be completely different to any other part of a pig. Pork is an incredibly versatile meat. They say the only part you can't eat is the oink. Here's my guide to getting the best out of familiar cuts. Smoked or unsmoked bacon is not just for breakfast. It's brilliant transforming salads, gives a real depth of flavour to stews, and is delicious in quick and easy pasta dishes. The leg joint, best known for ham, also makes an inexpensive, delicious Sunday roast and is great served with peas pudding. And the tenderloin fillet, incredibly lean, healthy and fast to cook. You can stuff it, cut it into scallops or strips that are perfect for Asian stir fries. A calm kitchen is an efficient and effective kitchen. The less stressed you are, the better the food you'll produce. So whenever you can, get ahead with your cooking. Here are three of my favourite recipes that can be made beforehand and whose flavour improves over time. First up, Moroccan lamb with sweet potato and raisin. This super simple, hassle-free recipe is cooked all in one pot. Start by browning chunks of lamb in hot olive oil. Colour and remove. Then fried onions. Season. Add chopped garlic, ground ginger and coriander. A teaspoon of whole cumin seeds, paprika and fennel seeds. A cinnamon stick, bay leaf and delicate strands of saffron. Then fry to release all the aromatic flavours. Next, add tomato puree chunks of sweet potato and the juicy browned lamb. For a sweet note, add plump raisins. Then cover with stock and simply leave to simmer for a couple of hours. 
delicious eaten straight away, but over time, the flavors will develop and improve. When you're ready to serve, simply finish with fresh parsley. Minimal preparation and ready when you want it. Fantastic Moroccan lamb with sweet potato and raisin. My next super simple dish that just gets better and better with time is chili chicken with ginger and coriander. Start by chopping chicken thighs into pieces. Now on with the marinade. Chop garlic, ginger, red chili, and lemon juice. In a pan, toast coriander and cumin seeds to release their flavors, grind, and add to the chicken. Then pour over plain yogurt. Add turmeric and season. Mix and leave to marinade from two hours to overnight. Next, fry chopped onions in olive oil. Then add chopped garlic and ginger, ground coriander, garam masala, and turmeric. Tomato puree and butter. Next, add the marinated chicken and all the remaining marinade and cook until tender. Finally, top with coriander. Marinated for flavor and cooked in 20 minutes. Chili chicken with ginger and coriander, a simple stress-free wonder. Having a delicious sauce on hand to serve with simply cooked fish or meat is a brilliant stress buster. My final recipe is sweet pepper sauce with grilled prawns. For the sauce, in hot olive oil, fry chopped garlic and diced bread. Then put them in a blender, add chopped tomatoes, blister the skin of red peppers under a hot grill, intensifying the flavor. Leave to cool, then they're easy to peel. Chop and add, blitz. Add smoked paprika, chili flakes, and roughly chopped almonds. A squeeze of lemon and a dash of sherry vinegar. Season, blitz again, and add olive oil. This sauce keeps really well in the fridge and will intensify in flavor. I love it with simple king prawns. Just add olive oil and griddle for two minutes on each side. Sweet pepper sauce with grilled prawns, simply delicious. Made in advance, ready when you want them. Three stunning, simple recipes that take the stress out of the kitchen. Beautiful. This is my ultimate cookery course, 100 recipes to stake your life on. I'll be showing you an amazing spicy chutney that's brilliant for transforming the simplest of suppers. They don't actually smell much, but the flavor they give off is extraordinary. But first, five more of my 100 tips to make your home cooking easier. Kicking off with how to skin and debone a fish the hassle-free way. This is basically a filleted side of salmon. It's been taken off the bone and now skin off. Pick up your knife, a really nice, broad, flexible filleting knife. A little sharpen, lift up the base of the towel and then just nick a little bit at the end there. Twist the knife almost as if it's horizontally underneath the salmon. Pull the skin and you slice the salmon underneath and let the knife do the work. Now, get your skin, flip it back over and check that you're not leaving too much salmon on top of the skin. Pull it back and nice and slowly. Get the skin, wrap it around your fingers, pull the salmon towards you and then just all the way through. Lay that down. One nicely skinned salmon, just like a perfect snake skin. Get your knife and just run the knife down and then with a pair of tweezers, these are fish tweezers, but you can use normal tweezers, look for the head up and pull. And with the skin being removed from underneath the salmon, the pin bones come out a lot easier. And the pin bones only go to just basically halfway along the fillet. One nice fillet of salmon, beautiful.
there's still plenty of flavor in the trimmings from a filleted fish. My tip is don't waste those fish bones. Add to water, wine, a bay leaf, and some chopped veg to make a simple but versatile fish stock at home the perfect base for a delicious fish soup. A great tip for intensely flavored, stress-free veg is to steam them in their own juices. Simply add to a pan with a knob of butter and seasoning, then cook on a low heat with a lid on to lock in the moisture. For crispy roast potatoes, you can depend on my tip is to parboil them, leave them to steam dry, then sprinkle them with semolina or flour and give them a good roughing up. This ensures they go really crispy in the oven. A great tip for browning meat or fish is to dry it with kitchen roll before you cook it. Then you'll get a much better color. Too much moisture makes the meat steam instead of sear, and you'll lose that rich brown crust like the one I got on those sticky pork ribs. Another secret to taking the stress out of cooking is to anticipate the really busy times when you'll need things to hand that are already made. My next recipe can be kept on tap in the fridge for weeks on end, and it's guaranteed to liven up any quick meal. Spicy chutney. With chutney standing by in the fridge, you can always add that special little touch to a simple supper. Prove that thinking ahead always pays off. Pan on to start toasting those spices. Keep the pan nice and low. Cumin, very aromatic, very fragrant, and it's almost like a light spice. Next, nice little coriander seeds. Coriander in. Now you're going to get a bit of heat in the chutney. Mustard seeds, a lot smaller than coriander seeds, but so much more powerful. Mustard seeds in. Now, curry leaves. They don't actually smell much dry, but the flavor they give off is extraordinary. Curry leaves in. Really important not to burn them, otherwise you'll have that bitter taste across the chutney. Keep the gas nice and low. The secret is sort of toasting them so it releases that oil and intensifies the spice. A touch of salt. And then a couple of small, powerful chilies. Keep them whole. No one's going to eat them, but it gives that real nice burst of heat. Now, let them toast gently there. We're not going to chop the onion, we're going to grate it. Why? Because it sort of breaks down to a really nice puree in the chutney when you grate it. Hold the root in the palm of your hand and just push. Nice long grates. Want those nice long shards. Look, I've almost got a nice sort of onion puree, but it's nice and clear. A touch of olive oil. Spices, nicely toasted, onions in. Three nice cloves of garlic, lightly crushed them. Lay it nice and flat, and just slice the garlic. Nice thin slices. Garlic in. Taking your time to get the onions caramelized beautifully will really reap rewards in the long run. Tamarind paste and sugar. In with the sugar first. Three nice tablespoons of sugar. That will give a really nice syrup effect. A sort of nice, rich, syrupy texture to the chutney. Tamarind paste. You can get tamarind paste in most delis and the big supermarkets. It's a really nice thickening agent, but it gives that tartness to the chutney. And it's sort of rich, sugary, spicy. Next, in with my coconut. Add four nice tablespoons. That will give a nice body and a really nice texture to the chutney. Cook that coconut out, and now add the carrot. Grate it. The carrot just gives the chutney a really nice sort of crunch, but it also helps to sort of cool down the spice. Carrots in. The water comes out of the carrot, flavors the chutney beautifully, but gives that nice sort of vibrant, bright color to it as well. And grating it almost sort of, it cooks instantly, but I want a bit of texture through here. Turn down the gas and just let that simmer for five minutes. If the carrots aren't that moist and juicy, then put a couple of tablespoons of water in there to help it along. Now, just cook that out for five minutes. Chop 
just as those carrots start going nice and soft. Don't overcook them. You want that nice texture in there. Slightly spicy, slightly sweet. Gas off. Keep those chilies in there for that. It's beautiful. It's nice and gooey, delicious, and ready to go in its jar as that sits in the fridge. It just gets better and better and better. I love to eat this chutney with cold meat or even cold fish, but with ham, it's amazing. It's a really nice way of livening up the ham. Just sort of roll it up. Get a nice spoon of chutney. I mean, it looks fantastic. Chutney onto the plate and serve. And that is a nice little gem in the fridge that is worth prepping in advance for. Follow my ultimate cookery course crammed with key lessons. Top tips and 100 recipes to stake your life on, and you'll literally be cooking yourself into a better chef. Many of these amazing recipes are on my app. Please check out the App Store for details. Go on, get cooking. Packed with quick cooking tips, know-how, and 100 recipes to stake your life on. Right, this is my guide to amazing home-cooked street food classics. Street food gets its name because it's cooked and eaten on the streets. From the hawker markets in Asia to the New York hot dog stands, there are some great chefs out there serving seriously delicious food that you can eat on the go. My first recipe is a special mix of fantastic flavors from around the world. Beef tacos with wasabi mayo. The great thing about street food is anything goes. The only rule is they've got to be really fast and really tasty. Now, these tacos mix a Mexican and Japanese flavors into a delicious, meaty mouthful. First off, get that pan really nice and hot. These are sirloin steaks. Sear it in the pan with all that fat on. It'll add flavor. Salt and pepper. A couple of tablespoons of olive oil in. Pan, nice and hot. Hold up the steak and lay it in. Always lay away. Give the pan a little shake and it stops the steak from sticking. We're looking for color. But if it sticks, it's gonna burn. While the steaks are cooking, I can go on with my super quick marinade. Now, two tablespoons of miso paste. That's a fermented soybean. That gives a really nice sort of rich sweetness. Tablespoon of sugar, a couple of tablespoons, rice wine. That gives it a really nice vinegary kick. A couple of tablespoons of olive oil, salt and pepper. I'm looking for a nice sort of thick, rich marinade. Marinade done, it's time to turn the steaks. Fill the pan and to give the steaks a little base. All we're doing every time is just adding more and more flavor. Take your tongs and sort of lift the steak on its back and really melt all that fat down. Off with the gas, take them out. Just take your knife, see all that fat there, just slice that off. I don't want any of that. Now, in to the marinade. Beautiful. Tacos are one of Mexico's most popular street foods. They can be made from beef, pork, chicken, or fish, and are loaded up with amazing sauces and spices. Now, I want something sort of pickly, cabbage. These are um, Chinese cabbages. Slice it in half. And look at it, really crisp and really tasty. We're gonna slice that into quarters and then just shred it and take your time. Think of cabbage here and you think of sort of braised, overcooked cabbage, nothing worse. But in a taco you want freshness, a little season of chili flakes. They sort of discreetly give it a little bit of heat, a little touch of rice wine vinegar. If you haven't got that, fresh lemon juice. A small drop of toasted sesame seed oil. Give that 
A really good mix. Now I need something to sort of bring it together. We take some wasabi paste. Very hot, very spicy. A sort of thumbnail size. I'm going to mix that with a couple of tablespoons of mayonnaise. And give that a really good mix. These are basic corn tortilla. The trick is to sort of color them and then shape them. Actually place it on the gas ring. Use some tongs so as not to burn yourself. You can also toast your tacos in a frying pan. From there, I'm just going to place it on the rolling pin. Literally 30 seconds as it cools down. The great thing about serving tacos is people can fill them themselves just the way they want them. Cabbage. Just squeeze out wet marinade. Make a nice, rustic little mountain. Mayonnaise on. Wait, you see how soft and delicious and almost sort of melting in the mouth texture we've got on this amazing sirloin. So got that really nice sear around the outside. It's just nice and pink in the middle. Start off with my crispy shell. Back of the spoon with the wasabi mayonnaise inside the taco. And just sprinkle that delicious pickled cabbage. And then just start lining my taco with three or four slices. Touch more of my spicy mayo. And that is how I'd make the perfect taco. When you want comfort food quick, fast food classics always deliver. Here are three more of my street food favorites. All super easy, but still put the gourmet into grab and go. This street food dish packs a wonderful Indian influence. Subtly spiced chicken wrap. Grab a mortar and pestle to make a spicy marinade for the chicken. Crack open cardamom pods and add. Brown ginger coriander, cinnamon, grated nutmeg, cloves of garlic, fresh coriander, lemon juice, olive oil, and season. Now pulverize to form a paste. Pour over the chicken thighs and leave to marinate for up to two hours. To cook, griddle on a high heat to get wonderfully charred meat. Once the chicken is cooked, warm through tortilla wraps on the same griddle. Then simply slice your chicken and put your wrap together. Top with shredded cabbage, chopped spring onion, and your favorite chili sauce. Ready in 20 minutes, sticky, succulent, an utterly Moorish spiced chicken wrap. You'll find my next fast food classic all over America. Tasty chili dogs. For super quick and easy beef chili, add chopped onions to hot olive oil and cook until soft. Then add chopped garlic, a teaspoon of cumin seeds, and stir to release their lovely aromatic flavor. Next, chili powder. Turn up the heat and break beef mince into the pan. Brown and season. Add tomato puree and cook through. Next, a glug of spicy Worcestershire sauce. Chopped in tomatoes, dried oregano, add a sprinkle of sugar, Cook frankfurter or bratwurst sausages, bung in a bun, and simply top with the spicy beef chili. Easy and irresistible. A dog worth crossing the street for. My third street food inspired recipe is Vietnamese style baguette with beef. It's 
start slicing sirloin steak into strips. Then simply marinate in soy sauce, the salty, and runny honey, the sweet. And leave for up to two hours. Then thread your marinated beef strips onto skewers. And pan fry in hot olive oil. For the topping, which adds a lovely sour contrast, grate carrot and simply leave to pickle in rice vinegar. Next, make the easy dressing. Simply de-seed and chop a chili. Add caster sugar and lime juice. Add a glug of fish sauce. Slice a baguette. When lovely and brown, the marinated steak skewers are done. Remove and add. Top with the pickled carrot. Add cool sliced cucumber. Drizzle over the spicy dressing. And to finish it off, add coriander leaves. Simple to make, but complex in flavor. Absolutely delicious. Three stunning recipes from the streets to your home guaranteed to take food on the run to a whole new level. And so simple to do. You don't need to spend a fortune on masses of kitchen equipment. Here's my quick guide to another cooking essential. Frying pan. For me, one of my favorites. Why? Because it's so versatile. Whether you're searing the most amazing rack of lamb, cooking duck breast, sautéing chicken, or even a quick omelette, or even frying an egg, all in one. Look for an oven-proof frying pan with a metal handle if you want to cook like pros, by finishing off your dish in the oven or under a hot grill. Just don't forget, when you take it out, the handle will be hot. If you can, get a high-quality non-stick one with a thick, heavy base, which will distribute the heat evenly. Brilliant. Welcome back to my ultimate cookery course. Next, on my guide to street food, I'll be whipping up an indulgent finger-licking treat. That is amazing. But first... Like any passionate chef, I want the best ingredients I can find, whether it's for savoury or sweet dishes. Next up, my guide to buying chocolate. Chocolate gives you such an instant hit. It's well worth knowing about the good stuff. And who better to ask than award-winning alchemist of the sweetest kind, Paul Young. Even when I don't want to think about it, I'm thinking about it. His cutting-edge approach to chocolate making has won him accolades around the world. So when you're out shopping, the best way is to look at your chocolate bar, look on the back and look at the percentage. That gives you how much cocoa is in the bar. And the more cocoa, the more rich, intoxicating flavour. So the most exciting bit is tasting chocolate. Good quality fine chocolate should have that clean snap. Bite a piece off and crunch it in your teeth. But stop chewing. Let it melt. Move it around the mouth and you'll find that by letting it melt, even dark chocolate that you've had before that seems quite bitter won't be. When you chew quickly, it releases tannin. It releases all the bitterness in the chocolate. Letting it melt, it's smoother and richer and you get all the flavour. And most excitingly is, it releases something into the brain called dopamine, which makes you feel good. And that's how you get addicted to real chocolate. Chocolate is not just an addictive treat. It's an amazing ingredient. Here's my take on which kind to use for what. White chocolate, with its sweet vanilla taste, is perfect used as a dipping or pouring sauce with fresh fruit or frozen berries for a quick dessert. Creamy milk chocolate is great for family-friendly puddings and treats, like quick baked cakes or melt it onto homemade crepes or waffles. Dark chocolate is rich and intense. I like using 70% cocoa stuff. Use it for ice creams that really pack a punch. 100% pure cocoa has a very powerful, intense taste, and only the real chocolate geeks eat it straight. And remember, chocolate isn't just for sweet dishes. For the famous Mexican mole sauce, this is the one to grab. Is there anything better than chocolate? They say sex, but that's sort of totally overrated. Chocolate is the key ingredient in my favorite sweet fast food dishes, which at their best are always irresistible, instant, and utterly satisfying. 
So when you want an indulgent chocolate hit, my next recipe will be right up your alley. Malt chocolate donuts. Street food is all about satisfying your cravings. These donuts are sweet, sticky, and absolutely delicious. First off, we're going to make the dough. Now, this dough takes a bit of time, but it's really exciting. I'm heating all of the milk with the sugar. This yeast, easy to get hold of. And when you make fresh donuts, you need fresh yeast. Adding some of the warm milk to the yeast will activate it, which will help the dough to rise. Just half. Give that a quick whisk. The sugar's dissolved in the milk. The fresh yeast disintegrates instantly. Set the yeast mixture to one side while it does its job. To start the main dough mix, I'm adding half the butter to the remaining milk. That gives the dough a nice silkiness. I want it light. So melt the butter into the milk. Flour into a sieve. That helps to make the dough nice and smooth. And you know what? When you've got a smooth dough, it sort of rises evenly. Add a pinch of salt and two egg yolks. Pour in the warm milk and melted butter. Don't start over-mixing it. When you over-mix the dough of a donut, it gets really tight. You're not going to let it aerate. Yeast in. Ooh, nice and warm. I love that smell. Now, I'm looking for a sort of elasticy texture. Just dropping off the spoon. Nice. Flour the board. Take the dough out. Lovely. Lightly sprinkle, touch more flour, and just pull it over and push in. And every time you're sort of turning it, almost like you're turning the dough into itself. The dough should just sort of relax. And it shouldn't be sticking to your fingers now. It's just nice and pliable. Set that in a nice clean bowl. A little sprinkling of flour in there. So as it starts to rise, it doesn't stick. Cover that with thin film. Leave the dough to rise in a warm place for 60 to 90 minutes until it's doubled in size. This stage is called proving. Now, whilst that's proving, get a pan on. For the chocolate filling or ganache, pour 500 ml of double cream into a saucepan and add honey. Bring the mixture to a gentle boil. Traditionally, we always put jam in there, but chocolate and donuts, wow, to die for. Add the cream. Now give that a good mix. The butter elevates the ganache into a really nice, shiny chocolate coat. Look at that. Whoa. Give it a really nice whisk. The whisking gives it that aerated texture to the ganache. You're just lightening the load a little bit. Whoa. Nice. Chocolate filling done. Put it in the fridge to cool, then it's time to gently roll out the dough. Just let it roll naturally, about a centimetre and a half in depth. Slice. One. Two. Place them on to your tray and let them rise again. Once the donuts have had 30 to 40 minutes to rise, it's time to shallow fry them in a pan filled one third full with hot vegetable oil. Risen, but look, they're sort of like little pockets of air. Right, here we go. Place these in nice and carefully. Four, maximum. If there's too many in the pan, the oil will go cold and the donuts will come out soggy. Turn them over. Beautiful. They're going to come out into some sugar mixed with some malt powder. 50-50. How do you tell they're actually cooked in the centre? Tap on top. It should be hollow. In. And just sprinkle the malt and the sugar. Shake off the excess. I get so excited every time I make donuts. Now, look at those beauties. These are delicious, eaten as they are. But the ganache is going to be the icing on the cake. Pipe them back. Peel the bag over your hand. Don't forget to 
pop the nozzle in. I want the texture. Almost like a little liquid inside. So I'm going to pipe them with a little bit warm. Hopefully with that burst of magic. Operation Donut. Lift up the donut. Squeeze, push in and fill. Just do you start seeing that chocolate coming out. And sit that back down. Mmm. Nice. Sit them on there. They've got a little bit heavier, and we all know why. Nice. That one's got my name on it. Oh, that is amazing. Oh. Next, my tricks of the trade and kitchen tips. Starting with how to do your steak the way you want it. I want to cook my steak rare, so by touching the steak, I want the same feedback as it is on the inside of my thumb. That's rare. As it starts to cook, it gets a lot firmer. Medium is there, semi-firm with a slight resistance. Well done is there. Rare. A great tip for getting meat or fish to cook faster is to score it, which allows the heat to penetrate quicker. This also allows marinades to be absorbed more deeply. For stain-free Tupperware, coat it thinly with oil, which acts as a barrier between plastic and food. It's so easy to make your own chili sherry to use in quick stir-fries or sauces. Take 450 mils of dry sherry, such as fino, and using a funnel, pour into a sterilized bottle. Add five whole Thai chilies, seal with a cork or lid, and leave to infuse for a couple of weeks. My tip for using any discarded chili seeds is plant them to grow yourself some new chili peppers. Plant in an eggshell or seedling trays. Start them indoors and move outside when they're ready. Follow my ultimate cookery course crammed with key lessons. Top tips and 100 recipes to stake your life on, and you'll literally be cooking yourself into a better chef. Many of these amazing recipes are on my app. Please check out the App Store for details. Go on, get cooking.